Hello, everyone. Today we are going to, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm going to edit that part out. Okay. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and because, all right, my producer put his head in. Anyway, all right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the very first podcast for In the Know with Kat Bobino. Today we have our extra special guest. Her name is DJ Cast, and she is joining us live from USC. She is an amazing, amazing STEM educator down at USC while she is also getting her PhD. I also have my guest, Steve Dorsey. Steve, you want to say hello? Hi, how's everybody doing today? Awesome. Pleasure to be here, Kat. Thank you for joining me. And DJ, do you want to say hello? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, no problem. All right. So we're just going to have a very, very awesome general conversation all around science, technology, engineering, and math. And so we want to learn more about DJ and the work she's doing down at USC. So DJ, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, I'd love to. So officially, my role is the STEM Programs Manager of USC's Joint Educational Project. And so what my job entails is that I have a staff of undergraduate and graduate students that are all STEM majors. Okay. I train them to teach science. And then we have partnerships with hundreds of local elementary classroom teachers that we partner with and we help supplement science instruction. And so it's a free program for the Title I, so the low income schools that we work with. And we provide all of the lesson plans that are all aligned to the new science standards, so next generation science standards. We um, provide all of the supplies because we do hands-on experiments with all of the different classrooms that we work with. Uh, we send the staff in, so we send in like a science specialist, but science specialist that comes in to teach in each of the classrooms, and then we also evaluate how the staff is teaching um, to make sure that they can grow as a you know science communicator um, within their classrooms because we want them to be able to improve and get better. Absolutely. Um, and so that's predominantly, that, that program itself is called the Young Scientist Program. Um, and that's the largest program that I manage currently. Um, there's also Wonder Kids, which is an after school STEM career program. And for that one, because STEM is very, is very broad. STEM, very. like so many things fall under what, you know, the umbrella that STEM is. And so what Wonder Kids does is that it chooses different fields of science every semester. Uh, we write hands-on curriculum introducing concepts of those fields. And then we end each unit by bringing in a scientist that's in that field to come in and talk. Um, the communities that we work with are predominantly low-income communities of color. And so we highly prioritize bringing in scientists of color and women whenever we can, um, because I, it's crucial for our students to see themselves represented in the scientists that we bring to them. Um, and so we have some funding. Um, it's actually a partnership between my dad, who's a cancer researcher, and the educational program. So we have a bit of cancer education funding from the, the Norris Cancer or Norris Comprehensive Cancer Center. And so a lot of our our units for Wonder Kids this year are very uh, medically inclined. Um, like we'll have a pulmonology unit where wow. um, one of my alumni, her name's Serby, she created an activity with, we made a cardboard human body box. Yes, I know, very high tech. Um, and we put a voice recorder with what different um, lung sounds sound like. So what regular lungs sound like, what do lungs with bronchitis sound like, asthma, lung cancer, each of those sound different. And then the students have to diagnose our cardboard patient uh, Wait, with a stethoscope because we put the voice recorder at a really low level. Oh, that's um, really so cool. We find lots of ways to make hands-on, like to make um, like very kind of complicated science more, like we translate it to an elementary level. Um, 
And so we also have a cancer education program as well that we, we similarly partner with classroom teachers. And we're introducing some of the science behind what cancer is at an elementary level as well. Um, that's predominantly what the programs are. We also do events just for students where depending on what grant funding we have come in, um, we do an after school workshop with about 50 students. We bring in a scientist that comes in and talks about potential careers, like when we did computer science, we brought in a lady from Pixar who was working on, um, I can't remember the movie right now, um, but we got to see the movie before it came out. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, one of the more recent the animation movies? Of it. Um, well, did, and then for this fall, we're actually going to do two, which is a lot for us. Um, we were chosen to do a contact with astronauts on the International Space Station. Um, so that's going to be we're going to be doing that on one of uh, at one of our schools in the fall. Mm -hmm. And then we're also going to be doing an earthquake workshop this fall. And so that's all with kids. And because we have all of these curriculum and all of these lessons, um, we want to help support elementary school teachers. And so we also do professional development where we teach teachers about all of the science as well, because we want to make sure that we provide them with all of these, you know, lesson plans and potential resources as well. Right. And so that's the general gist of my job. Well, your general gist is a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have a lot going on under your belt, and that is amazing. What do you think? Hey, it's, it's, it's really cool. It's, um, and I think they're very uh, uh, innovative ways to teach kids STEM. And that's the thing. It's just to stimulate that side of the brain where they where it fires and people get it. Right. As opposed to confusing them with, you know, with vernacular that no one understands, you know, really, unless you're like an advanced scientist or something. Right. And so um, Steve actually does his own thing. He is working on a STEM comic book and so uh, I just want Steve to give you a little bit about what he's doing as well okay yes it, it comes under my company's name 1906 edutainment studios um, and what we're doing is uh, you know we found out that at least a couple years back that the US ranked like 38th in the world in stem education and so um, I felt that if we came up with a creative way to teach stem uh, in this particular case uh, at least the first group that we're playing with are the, is medical science. Um, we created a series of characters called the Guardians of a Cure. And basically everything is based on scientific, historic, and medical fact. So in the in the digital comic book, it's not like we're saying, you know, cancer came from Krypton. It's not like that. It's like we actually interviewed families and families shared their personal experiences with a disease like leukemia and things like that. So, Steve, I think DJ's having a little bit of a hard time hearing you, so I was going to say speak a little bit more okay. into the mic. But, sure. yeah, sure. so um, Steve is doing some great things uh, with his company, 1906 Entertainment, and he is, uh, what he was saying was his comic books are all have a STEM background and it's historical fact in science and medicine. Mm -hmm. So we are working, or he's working towards giving the youth better way of learning STEM in a digital comic book form. So both of you guys are doing something really amazing when it comes to the students and teaching STEM. So DJ, back to you, everything that you're doing, all the work you're doing, how did you get started in the field? Well, one, I would love to see some of the work that Steve's working on with his digital science comic books. and. Maybe we can incorporate that into our STEM program somehow. I think that would be really cool to try and do from the program today. Um, but let's see, in regards to your question about how I got into all this, um, you know, it, it, I think it started for me in high school. Oh, wow. um, I was, it was my AP bio teacher who had a program called Oxy Science Bridges where we as high school students were partnered with a local elementary school and we were able to go and teach science in the local elementary school and i know i had a i had a great time doing that even even in high school and my um my ap bio teacher 
I, I swear, the first sight of this woman, um, she actually recommended me for a future educator award wow. when I graduated high school. Okay. Um, and, you know, it kind of, I always wanted to continue to do it. I did it at the, the university level. Um, I was actually one of the undergrads in the Young Scientist program myself, mm -hmm. so I understand where <laughs> what my, a lot of my staff are going through when they plan these lessons, when they go and teach them. I've, I've, I've been there, so I, I understand. Um, I did a ton of ocean education. I um, am part of a large ocean education community, the, the National Marine Educators Association. They're, they're a wonderful group of people. My mentors, you know, Linda Chilton and Lynn Whitley, were always extremely supportive of like my educational career. Um, and so I do have a background both in bio and marine environmental biology, um, but I realized as much as I loved ocean education, and it's still where my heart is, don't get me wrong, um, right. I realized that it's very niche and that I needed to be a little bit more marketable. Um, and so I did a second master's in, in education. It was a master's of arts in teaching with a science credential attached so that if I was going to do outreach, I'd be a, creden a credentialed teacher and that some of the liability wouldn't be there. Wow. That's a lot of foresight for you to get two masters for this. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. And, um, and now um, what I'm doing now is a, it's an EDD. So it's a doctorate of education. Right. And what I'm doing is I'm evaluating um, both science teacher educators and elementary school teachers on how to teach elementary school teachers to teach science because elementary school teachers in general are very uncomfortable with science. Right. Um, creating curriculum for them that will kind of meet many different needs that there's math, there's reading, and there's science that they can be covering all within the elementary school day. So that's really cool. Um, I just want to point out one thing. Like what was super intermins oh, I can't even say the word. Um, what got you going <laughs> in STEM education was a teacher. You know, it was a teacher in high school who was at the forefront and was able to uh, get you excited about STEM education and getting you excited about creating curricul curriculum. And so having like an amazing teacher be involved is something that's critical sometimes for some of the students. And so you going back and teaching the teachers how to do it, I think that that is awesome. What do you think? Hey, that's great. I never will, I never will forget Ruth Coleman, a uh, teacher I had in the fourth grade, and she got me really excited about science. And uh, they can really push those strings or push those buttons that you know, right. inspire you to do the best you can be. Yeah. Right, because I, I honestly, I had a teacher, I don't even remember his name, that's the sad part, but it was in <laughs> high school, and it was, a, I was a junior, and my school in Sunil High in Alameda, the back of it sits by an estuary, so you go through the school and the field, and then you're at an estuary, mm -hmm. and so I had a marine biology class, and he took us out in waders, we went out into the actual estuary, we got samples, and I just thought that was one of the most amazing classes I've ever taken. Cool. And being able to do something in the field mm -hmm. was was awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was interesting, DJ, when I heard you earlier talking about the curriculum, uh, one thing that we're doing is we're developing a, uh, like one of the superheroes in the Guardians of the Cure has the power of the periodic table. So, you know, kids are running to learn about Superman. Well. When I, I, I just finished a three week test pilot program and we had ages one through, I mean, grades one through four. And they were able to tell you after one class what the atomic number was, how many electrons per shell, wow. whether it was a gas, liquid, metal or solid. And they were actually learning the powers of this one character, but subliminally they were learning the periodic table. Nice. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, so DJ, when you go to these classrooms and you're talking to the students, what is the feedback that you're getting from these students? How are they, you know, taking in some of these science curriculum things? So are you asking for the for the classroom teachers or for the students? From the students. How are the students working with you and how the students taking in all this science information? 
so we um, we do a lot of hands or all of our experiments are very hands on, mm-hmm. and because we we don't we don't want to be lecturing, especially at the elementary school level. We don't want to be lecturing at students because like truthfully no one learns that way but especially not elementary school students um and so by having these hands-on ways of explaining the like the science they're all much more they're inquiry based Mm -hmm. and they're more it's we have the students really drive the conversation around science because i know that my staff know the science i don't doubt their contact knowledge in the slightest it's the students that they're working with that need to, to discover it, that need to learn it. Mm-hmm. And so by doing it in such a hands-on and inquiry-based way, they are really the drivers of their own STEM learning. And it's much, they're much more engaged. Um, we also do um, both science interest surveys at the beginning and at the end of the year, and mm-hmm. we have them draw what they think a scientist looks like. Right. And so when we first started asking them what they thought a scientist looked like, more, like more than 85% of the drawings were white males in the lab. Yes. Book. Yes. Even in this um, day and age. Yes. It, I've done the draw scientist test at the college level. And at the college level, it's still a white male. Yes. And so, um, actually, so I, we just pro- finished processing the data for this year. And for this year, we're at about 41% are drawing female scientists. Oh, that's awesome. Which I think is definitely attributed to a lot of the STEM uh, education staff is female. I think we're about 90% female right now. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, and then... 10% of them are drawing scientists of color. Okay. And 10% of them are also starting to draw themselves as future scientists. Oh my goodness. That's nice. awesome. Nice. Nice. That's awesome that they're seeing yeah, themselves in the great elementary. To really see those things change over time. Right. In yeah. elementary, you're seeing yourself in the scientist role. I think that's awesome. Right. I didn't think I saw myself as a scientist when I was in elementary, actually. I think I saw myself more as a uh, well, I used to like, I love animals to this mm-hmm. day. I love animals. And so when you say you love animals, sometimes in our community, the first thing they say is you're going to be a veterinarian. Right. So I thought I was going to probably be a veterinarian until I got older and realized there was more you can do with animals than just be a veterinarian. No hate to veterinarians. <laughs> I think that is a great and noble career. I just realized <laughs> later that, you know, there was more options. And I, I do want to take a pause. I see the people who are joining us Facebook Live. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to shoot them my way and we can enter it into the conversation. Mm-hmm. So Steve, did you have anything you wanted to ask DJ or anything that's on your mind? Um, you know, DJ, here's a question I have. Um, when you find that you're developing your curriculum for the kids, are you catering more so to the visual side of the brain or are you doing it more from the analytical side? Um, because when I hear you talking about white scientists versus scientists of color, I made sure that when we develop these characters for, for kids to see that I wanted black girls to see dark women with Bantu knots and nice, fig, you know, full figures because, you know, society's learned to kind of demonize that to a certain extent. And I wanted not only for you to want to push the realm of learning about STEM, but I wanted you to feel good about yourself in doing so. Because when you feel better about yourself, then then you're able to do greater things. And so it was a it was a it was a lesson in you know learning STEM, but at the same time building self-esteem and seeing yourself as a person, as a kid, who can actually grow up to be a superhero. You can grow up to be a pulmonologist, you can grow up to be an oncologist. And that's what these characters represent. So I wonder if that's in, in concert with what you're doing, DJ. I mean, a lot, yeah, a lot of our, um, we incorporate definitely very, definitely parts of the visual brain for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, we try and do a little bit of everything. So we we do both. We do visual. We have we have a lot of a different accommodations and modifications because we also work with um, special ed students mm-hmm. 
And so we make sure that we incorporate both visual, audio. We have a, lot, a few kinesthetic lesson plans where we really have students get up and moving. Mm -hmm. um, and, and let's see, so you were asking, um, kind of seeing themselves as the scientists in the future. Right. Did I hear that correctly? Correct. That was me, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I think that's our ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It is for them to really start to see themselves that, that way. And so I would love to see some of the work that you're doing in regards to that and see how we could add that to our program because yeah. I think it would only, you know, make it stronger. Oh, thank um, you. That would be great. Part of the goal of our program, too, is to make students more competitive for this program um, that the university has mm -hmm. called the Neighborhood Academic Initiative. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's a six-year college prep program for low-income students where the program provides anything that the kids would need to get into college at no cost. Right. So after-school tutoring, uh, SAT prep classes, summer classes, Saturday Academy, and they have a, a Saturday Science Academy. Um, they have a whole parental set of workshops where they do, like, financial aid or mm -hmm. how to send your baby to college. Right. Um, and, and different healthcare stuff too. And if they complete the program and get into USC, mm -hmm. they get free tuition for four and a half years. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. Nice. And I wonder, is that the only school that's doing that? Or is there any other California schools who are doing something similar? Do you I'm know? Current, I'm currently not aware of other schools doing it to this extent. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, but what I really, for me, what the ultimate goal is, and we, and I've done it a little bit now, um, is when, because these scholars are from the neighborhood that we're currently teaching science in. And so, like, last year, I had uh, Jasmine Sanchez and Marianne uh, Cabrales. She, they were both, like, teaching in the schools they went to elementary in. Wow. That's and awesome. And so they're now, like, undergrad STEM majors teaching science in their classrooms that they were in before. And for me, that's the ultimate goal of our program is to be able to really have a community impact like that and then have it be like a, a pipeline into potential STEM careers. Okay, that's awesome. I just want to um, shout out Jamil. He has joined us and said hello and tuned in on our Facebook Live. So I want to say hi. I know a couple of y'all have joined. I'm not sure who's still on. A couple of people had um, said they were watching. So if you're still watching, say hello so I can shout you out. But um, anyway, back to you, DJ. Um, I think that a lot of the stuff that you are doing is amazing and how you guys started having a teacher influence that's great um and stem stem is one of the things that's a part of life that we do every day but i wanted to get away from stem for a second and just ask you what do you do for fun when you're not doing this work <laughs> that's that's a hard one because uh, okay. i feel like that stem is, is part of my life in many many different ways mm -hmm. um for fun, I, I think I would have to say travel. My my husband and I are both international, so he was born in Hong Kong but raised in Brazil, and I'm from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And both of us get a little stir crazy if we don't leave the country at least once a year. Right. Um, so I think for fun is is us trying to travel around the world. But I'm very biased, so I choose very sciencey places to go travel. <laughs> I love it. Hey, yes, and so for the record, DJ and I are friends on Facebook, and I get jealous every time I see them <laughs> fly Travel somewhere simply. because I'm like, well, I would like to go. I can't be a third wheel, so I just, you know, look from afar and be like, that seems nice. Where was the last place you Come on went? over, Kat. I mean, that's how we met. We met in New Zealand yes. in the School of Rock. Yes. Yeah. So, yes. When your husband find flights, just tell him, let me know, then maybe Tavari and I can join y'all. So I won't be a third wheel. I'll drag Tavari with me. <laughs> he, even though he doesn't like to travel, but I'm going to just, I'm going to make him. He has to learn. But um, <laughs> where, where's the last place that you guys went? Where did you go? 
Um, so we went during, um, I don't know, we're kind of into cold places right now. Yes. Um, you know, seeing all the glaciers before humans destroy them, you know, yes. stuff like that. And so we traveled to Norway this year during spring break. And so we got to go, we got to go dog sledding. Mm -hmm. um, we flew, he, my husband is a techie nerd, which I love. Yes. Um, and so he took his drone and we got to fly that around just the most gorgeous landscapes. Um, we uh, went reindeer sledding, which let me tell you, is super slow. Uh, <laughs> it's literally basically you know, the first person that's holding a, like, literally like a, a rope to the first set of reindeer. And it, it, it's just walking speed. It was the slowest sledding I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, we really just love traveling the world together. Yeah. Um, and we really have a good time. And which reminds me, Kat, you need to apply to Polar Trek. I applied last time, but I'm applying again because I do want to do Polar Trek. Apply every year. I You're, you need to go on that. I know. I know. If you want to tell the audience, what is Polar Trek? So there's a program called Polar Trek. And so it's polar and then teachers and researchers educating and collaborating. Mm -hmm. And it will send educators uh, to, as a, in a partnership with like scientific researchers to either the North or South Pole fully funded. Yes. Yes. I am. Not, I plan so, on applying um, again. I, please apply every year. I applied twice before I got accepted. Okay. So I mean, don't even be though, disheartened. yeah, I'm not a fan of the cold, but how often do you get opportunity to go to either the North or the South Pole? Right? Yeah, I wouldn't write the not a fan of the cold into your episode. I'm not. I, I am absolutely <laughs> that will, that's negated. Maybe I'll even edit it out of this podcast in case they look at it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I have to go. Like, I mean, you have to do these things. You have, well, me, I'm not going to tell anyone what they have to do. But I love to travel. I love to see new things. And I'm just like you when I, I like to do the science aspect of it. And being able to go to either the North or the South Pole, like, yes, please send me. I will buy as many warm clothes as possible. Send me. Would you go, Steve? No. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can appreciate what you guys are doing, but I'm a black man who just loves warm weather. Um, I lived in Seattle for a while and, and all that rain and snow. I love my friends in Seattle, but that's why I came back to California. I mean, I I appreciate what you guys are doing, studying the glaciers, but right. just send me an email. Okay, and some send photos. you some photos. Yeah. Got it. But now, but now when you go to uh, New Zealand, to like Papua New Guinea, I'll, go, I'll do that. Oh, my God. New Zealand. Yeah. We went in the New Zealand's winter, our summer, but it, it wasn't that bad. It was right. like our winter out here in California, right. but it was beautiful yeah. and absolutely amazing. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So I work with those tropic zones, but then when it starts dropping below Australia. Okay. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll go with you there too, Steve. Yeah, not, I, I'll tell you that those are some cool places there. I you know, that's okay. But I, I, I gotta be honest with you. Polar Trek, I love you guys for that. That's good. But, but that's a no for you. But I'm gonna miss that one. Yeah. I got you. I get it. Yeah, it it's an amazing program, and it, it you really become part of the the Polar Trek family. Mm -hmm. So I just I, I highly recommend it. And I went with them to the North Pole in 2016, and it was just it was the experience of a lifetime. It was fantastic. So have you been able to watch the the the, the rapid uh, decline as far as the, the the ice masses there, like as far as the glaciers? I mean, is it is it melting at a at the rate that Phenom you know, astronomically more than what we're being told. I mean, have you had a chance or your husband had a chance to see it firsthand? So I was specifically in the Arctic tundra. Mm. And so what's, what's fascinating about the environment there is that they have what's called permafrost, mm. which is essentially a fancy word for frozen soil. Right. And that permafrost, can be like even a few inches deep mm. and um so like we here in california have what's like a, it's called the active layer which is the space where plant roots will grow right 
And because they have so much frozen soil, their active layer up there is very small. Mm. Um, and so all of, like, there's very little trees in the Arctic tundra. Uh, they're all very, like, shallow plants because their roots have to grow in such a small space. They tend to grow outward right. mm-hmm. um, instead of down. Mm-hmm. And really kind of seeing, like, if that all starts to melt, mm. like, that would have just, devastating consequences for that whole ecosystem because they are just not built for other like other uh, they're just they've been adapted for that local environment right and so i definitely saw some of like the potentials of what could happen especially in the arctic tundra Mm -hmm. um it was insane wow wow that is, that's sad. It's sad to think about that this is something that's happening mm-hmm. in our lifetimes, but it's something that's been, the cause of it has been our ancestors, basically. Just not paying attention. And um, us. Yeah, yeah, and, and we're us. Not with, we're not without blame either. You're right. We are definitely not without blame. I mean, I know I rather be alone in my car than, you know, ride share half the time. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. I should, I could, I don't. And so, yes, but I got to say I'm, I'm a part of the blame as well. Yeah, but then you got the deforestation of like the, the, the Amazon Valley and, you know, you you know, how much how much do we depend on that 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 mass of vegetation alone for our oxygen on the earth? Right. Yeah. You know, so as as you know, we're impeding on, you know, civilizations that have been really cool with just being aside from our society. Not only are we impeding on their ground, but then we're taking away you know, the, 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 the environments or micro environments of, you know, insects and reptiles and yes. all animal life that be the bee population is diminishing rapidly. Yes. I mean, you know, you it, it, it's not yeah. people start getting upset about it when they start losing that wine. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Yeah. 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 All right. So, yeah, um, so and part of the problem there is that we really need to have just systematic change at the the local level the the state level the national level and at the international level to really make you know impactful change throughout and in, in many aspects of of what's happening on our planet currently right 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 okay yeah. Yeah. so um before so before we go i want to say thank you again and dj is there anything that you want the audience to know about you or the work that you're doing tell us whatever you want to know for uh for us to know about dj Cass. um i'm very biased uh so i love i love science i love science education and i love it so much that i wear science dresses to work every day yes Yes, she does. And I have about 35 of them now. Wow. I, I can attest. Yes, she does. <laughs> Is there anything that... What does a uh, science dress look like? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> what does a science okay. dress look like? Okay. Oh. Um, it depends. And so, like, um, tomorrow I am doing a lesson on climate change with high school students. Uh-huh. And so I'll be wearing my weather dress. Um, and so it's covered in all sorts of like sun, clouds, thunderstorm, little like weathery labels. Um, and so I'm trying to be thematic with what we're doing uh, in class tomorrow. Nice. Yeah. So, Steve, you, have you ever seen the Magic School Bus? Well, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. And Miss Frizzle and her dresses that right, she wears? Right. Okay. Think that. Okay. So that's what DJ does okay. on a continuous basis, which I think is amazing. You know, DJ, we have to talk because besides the Guardians, we're developing a group of characters called the uh, Eco Six that deal with climate change. And, you know, so hearing you talk about different environments and, you know, like oceanography and botany, that would be great for us to talk about as well. Okay. Like so. I said, you know, Kat can put us in touch and yeah. I would love to see the work that you're doing and, and talk all about climate change because the the uh, especially the polar trek family Mm -hmm. that that is most of the focus of the researchers and the teachers that go out to the north and the south pole and so we have a 
a whole network of people that could potentially you could contact for yeah. like what does the authentic science say mm-hmm. about what's happening in each of these exactly. different places. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. So um, if you want to learn more about the work that DJ is doing, hit me up first. And then I will vet you because <laughs> DJ is amazing. And then I will send you her way or I'll ask her to talk to you. But let me tell you, you want DJ Cast in your life because she's awesome. <laughs> oh, thanks, Kat. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for being on my inaugural show. And I appreciate everything that you do and being uh, very patient with me tonight. So I want to make sure I let you go on a great note. Again, this is DJ Cast from USC. She is doing amazing work in STEM education. She's a STEM education superstar. And if you want to know more about her work, literally just Google her and you will see it. (laughs) You can't beat that, huh? (laughs) All right, DJ, you want to say goodbye to our audience? Bye, everyone. And Kat, you look fantastic in your lab coat. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to uh, talk a little bit. Of, um, Steve and I are going to talk a little bit as we close out the podcast, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to go. I know we, I've had you on the horn or at least on waiting and the horn for like an hour. So thank you again for being on the podcast. It's nice meeting you, DJ. Anytime. Let me know when you want me to come back. Okay, absolutely. All right. Bye. So, Steve, what did you think? That was great. Yeah? That was great. Yeah, I really look forward to, to working with her, talking to her. Yeah. Oh, yeah, she's, she's amazing. An amazing person. Yeah. yeah. You know, I like her. I like her, her, her different view on things. And her okay. On STEM. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Looks like I'm getting a phone call. Hold on just a second. Let's see. Hello? Hey, how you doing? This is Chris. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, what is your podcast about? Oh. Thank you for asking. Um, our path, our podcast, excuse me, is all about STEM education. So science, technology, engineering, and math. We are talking to professionals in the field, and we are asking them how they got started, the work they're doing, and what they want to do in the future. So the reason for the podcast is we want to make sure that youth and adults have a better understanding of what STEM is. Also, the opportunities that's within STEM. Mm-hmm. So that is what the podcast is about. Cool. So we can ask you like science questions too, right? Like how batteries work and, you know, about stuff like that. You can ask Kat. <laughs> um, yes. I say, you know, feel free to ask us questions about science. Um, when we have that guest, make sure that question goes to the guest and the science that they're doing. Um, if I know the answer, I will tell you, but I am not ashamed to say I do not know. But yes, you can ask us any questions. want to shout out my cousin, Ushan. I see you. You're on there. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> do you come on the same time like every week? What, what's the average time that you come on? Ooh, good question. So this is our first podcast. Um, hopefully we will be same time, same place. I'm going to say around 6.30, 6.45 um, start time on a Wednesday. So if you're around, please feel free to join us for the podcast, ask questions, be a part of the show. That is everything that I want from you as an audience. Okay, cool. Thanks for the information. Thank you for calling, Chris. All right. So I know, right? right? First call in. I love it. If you want to call in and you know my number, go ahead and call me and we can put you on the show. If you have any questions, you want to be a part of it, just let me know. So, Steve, is there anything you want to say before we close out? You know, I, I you know, the cat, I'm so proud of what you're doing. Thank and, you. Uh, and I really like the way, you know, you're changing the face of STEM, the look of STEM education. And, right. And I like the way you're, you're, you're your own authentic self and you have cat's way of doing things and it's an honor to be here with you on the first show oh appreciate and, uh, that and sis just really proud of you and i hope that everybody and even young girls watch you and see the amazing person that you are so it's a great thing awesome so before we close out i do want to shout out um all the work you're doing oh dj you're on or you're too still watching <laughs> i love you too you can get that 
Ooh, what? No, this is it. Y'all <laughs> need to know, check no, him out. You know, okay, let me tell you guys. This was like little... when we were like first just coming up with some conceptual Ooh. sketches of things. But uh, you know, if you want to see, if you want to see the Guardians the way they're developed to this point, you can go to uh, 1906edutainment.com or .org, and there are just Google Guardians of a Cure, and a cure is one word: A C U R E. Yeah. Yes, I love it. And so I want to shout out Where Media Meets Studio. That's where we're having our podcast tonight. And Where, Me- where Media Meets Studio is an amazing group of people who are doing awesome things in movies, television, VJ TV, and now podcasts. So I want to say a great thank you to them and James Rockefeller the third for allowing me to use this space and helping me out tonight. And again, I want to say thank you to you, Steve, for being a part of the show and being my guest co-host. And again, thank you, DJ Cass, for being on the show and telling us all about your amazing life. So again, if you want to know more information, you want to be a part of the show, you want to be one of our guests, make sure that you just hit me up. You can hit me up on social media. All my social media is Kat Bobino. That's Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and I think also Snapchat. Right. Not that I use Snapchat that often, but all those um, things you do to give her the accolades she deserves: subscribe, like, share, love. Oh, thank you. All that. <laughs> all that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So uh, we are signing off, and until next time, we're gonna have another person in science, tech, engineering, and math telling them telling us their great story. So if you want to know more information, tune in, ask questions, call me during the podcast, and we will get you going. And we want to educate everyone as much as we can on what we can do in STEM. Right. So good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. <laughs>